Berkowitz. So um, I'm going to give you guys the choice of either coming up to this if you're more comfortable standing or just using the, the handheld mics. I'm a, I already warned them that I'm brutal on time, even to the point of being impolite. So they're prepared for that. You shouldn't be shocked. And um, the goal is truly to, to, to be able to cover a lot of territory and then get engaged in the discussion. So, no. Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm Evan Mandry. I'm the chairperson of our Department of Criminal Justice. Um, we received a somewhat cryptic email last night telling us that the uh, Attorney General's remarks today would be about uh, Section 8B of the Court of Claims Act. And um, I'm an admirer of, the, uh, of Eric for a long time, so I was relatively confident which direction the proposed changes would be in, but I wasn't sure of how much of a step in the right direction it would be. And um, for some inside baseball reasons, it's actually an extremely substantial step what he proposed today. Um, the way the Court of Claims Act uh, works, it exempts anybody from recovering who co uh, contributed or caused their wrongful conviction. And that language is ambiguous, but as interpreted, it precludes recovery by anybody who confessed to the crime. And as he alluded to in his remarks, uh, false confessions aren't just an occasional occurrence. They're the majority cause of uh, or majority uh, factor in uh, wrongful conviction. So in fact, over a 20 year period between 1984 and 2003 of 175 people who petitioned for damages under uh, Section 8B, 12 recovered. Um, so Jeff is not just unusual in his academic prowess and uh, his presentation as a human being, he's also statistically unusual in that he actually brought a successful claim under the act. And it's a huge problem. Um, I always think about, when I talk about this problem, this is the only system that I know of, uh, and I'm a lawyer by training, in which victims, no one pays for injuries, right? People who are wrongfully convicted are victims in the truest sense. They're utterly powerless, and in fact, the sort of people who get wrongfully convicted are the most powerless. And it's a system where no one pays. Somebody hits you with their car, you sue them and you get damages. But in this system, no one pays. And the people who contribute to the risk of wrongful convictions are very, very powerful. Uh, no prosecutor pays, no jury pays, that might be, no juror pays, that might be more complicated for uh, some other reasons. Um, and furthermore, the only cost that someone might, no police officer pays, the only cost that someone might pay, say a prosecutor pays through the political process, by the time someone is able to vindicate themselves through the system, so much time has passed that that person has moved on to another office, so they don't even pay the political cost of the wrongful conviction that they may have fostered by having overly aggressive procedures or not taking a claim of innocence seriously enough. Let me just add one other dimension to this. Um, the, the fairness component of this argument is overwhelming and I think decides the issue, but um, we talk about evidence and from an, what the data shows is that as a public, public policy matter, uh, compensation is something that we should all be concerned about even if you don't feel it as a moral issue. So um, a group of colleagues and I, and uh, this is a pitch if you're not at John Jay and you want to come, it's a faculty colleague of mine a former doctoral student who's now a professor at Fairleigh Dickinson and an undergraduate who's now a PhD student uh, at a top uh, program in social psychology. We tracked uh, 100 and a cohort of approximately 120 exonerees following the release. And about half of these exonerees were people who had no prior record. So talk about that insidious argument that, you know, well, if this person didn't do something wrong, they probably did do this wrong, they probably did something else wrong. We have pretty substantial evidence that for about half of this cohort, they didn't do anything wrong in their life. And when they were released from prison, they should look more or less like you or I in terms of the risk that they uh, present over the years following release. What we found here are a couple of shockers. Uh, about a third of them received no compensation in our cohort. Uh, that approximately doubled their risk of ending up back in the prison system. So imagine this trajectory. You do nothing wrong in your life. You're wrongfully convicted. You spend 11 years in prison. You most likely fail in getting, your, getting compensation for yourself, and you end up in prison, not for, you know, not for the thing that you did, but because you can't make a living or something like that. And whatever the reason, society has an interest in those people successfully reintegrating into society, not just from a moral standpoint, but from a practical standpoint. 
another Whopper that comes out, and we weren't expecting this, and uh, if, the, uh, if uh, the Attorney General is looking for a, a list of other things to consider, expungement turns out to be a huge risk factor for people following the release. You would think this would be a no-brainer, right? You didn't do the thing, it shouldn't show up on your record. But in fact, approximately 35% of the time, it shows up on your record. And for all of the reasons you might imagine, this substantially increases someone's risk of failing uh, follow their release into society. They can't get a job, they can't get loans. There are all kinds of barriers to this. Actually, New York's compensation statute, it's a little bit, it's pretty bad, but it's not, it's not that bad. Uh, I mean, there are worse, and there are some states that don't permit recovery at all. Um, but the expungement statute is pretty good. They do better than most, but we still have about 15% um, of exonerees in New York who aren't able to get their records expunged. So my pitch on this is I think the moral case is a sufficient case, but if that doesn't motivate you for whatever reason, and I'm guessing this audience, it probably does motivate all of you, but if it didn't motivate you, there's a substantial public policy reason why it's in society's interest to make sure that these people's records are cleared as they deserve to be and that they're fairly compensated for the time that they spent as victims of the criminal justice system. Thanks very much for everyone for coming. Good morning. So first let me start by commending and thanking Attorney General Schneiderman for enabling a broader group of wrongfully convicted individuals to attempt to seek compensation for their wrongful incarceration. Um, I, Alexander Hamilton, one of the founders of our democracy, said that the first duty of society is justice. And I think these changes that the Attorney General proposed today are in the best interest of fairness and justice. Because wrongful convictions have plagued the criminal justice system for a number of years. And advances in DNA technology have shown that, have increased the number of convictions that have been proved to be wrong. In 2008, uh, the incoming president of the New York State Bar Association, Bernice Lieber, uh, recognizing that wrongful convictions had been a serious problem in the criminal justice system, uh, convened a task force to study the issue. And they were concerned about the fact that it, the number of exonerations were really undermining the assumption that the criminal justice system was protecting the innocent. So they sought to determine the causes of the exonerations and reduce the risk of convicting the innocent. And they engaged in 53 case studies of people who had actually been convicted and they came up with recommendations regarding defense practices, identification proceedings, um, interrogation techniques, uh, forensic practices, as well as government practices. But they also reviewed the remedies and compensation that, was, that people who had been wrongfully convicted were entitled to and proposed reforms to the compensation, which were viewed at that time as too restrictive. As you heard, I'm going to, so I'm going to discuss some of the recommendations that that, that task force made with respect to um, what should be done after a person has been found to be wrongfully convicted. <clears throat> As you heard from uh, the Attorney General, the Court of Claims Act Section 8, 8B requires the person to prove by clear and convincing evidence that he did not by his own conduct cause or bring about this conviction, his conviction. So if you've pled guilty or if you've confessed, that's been deemed a barrier to seeking redress under the Court of Claims Act. The Bar Association, uh, and this was five years ago when there were not, uh, there were not as many cases had really been established as wrong, wrongful convictions, although it was a growing trend. I don't think it was as clear at how many people were falsely confessing and the fact is involved in false confessions. So at that time, they focused on confessions that were co coerced and that and pleas which were taken with uh, inadequate uh, assistance of counsel. But they did determine that entering a plea of guilty should not automatically deter an innocent individual from seeking compensation with certain caveats. I think the last five years have given, given us reason to eliminate those caveats. Those caveats that they recommended were that the plea was based upon the negligence of the defense attorney 
or the plea had been entered under duress or the confession made under duress. And I think the, the facts demonstrate that there are far more, more people uh, involved in the criminal justice system who have been convicted wrongfully, who have not necessarily pled guilty because of duress. Um, so that, that proposal actually failed to address the, the false confessions. Uh, in fact, I guess 25%, I think, the innocence projects of the, of the people who have been found, uh, have been exonerated, 25% of them, of those cases, involved false confessions or admissions or statements. Um, and in New York State, the New York State study that they did, um, there were those 53 cases that they examined, 23% of those involved false confessions. In terms of the compensation, um, there is, as was mentioned to you earlier, New York is probably not the worst, but it's not, certainly not the best. But there's no fixed minimum per year. So the recommendation was that there ought to be a fixed minimum per year of incarceration with the option for the individual to actually seek additional damages uh, if, if they chose to do so. Uh, another factor that they looked at, and you're going to hear a lot more about this from Karen Wolf when she comes up, is that individuals are not prepared to react, and you heard that earlier from, um, you heard that earlier today, they're not prepared to re-enter the communities because they've been locked away for long periods of time. Uh, they've been locked away from their families. They've been locked away from their communities. And there's no provision made for them to return to those communities. Although the provisions made for people who are convicted of crimes are limited, and I, I would not say that we have a re really great re-entry program for those who have been convicted, but for those who have been exonerated, there's no program whatsoever. So the committee recommended that, if, and I will read the recommendation, based on need, uh, the immediate provision of subsistence funds and access to services to assist reentry should provide, be provided to all individuals who have been released from prison after receiving a pardon on the grounds of innocence. And the services that they're talking about are assistance getting affordable housing, job training, education, health care, and child custody assistance. The other factor that they addressed, one of the other factors they addressed, is the record of an arrest haunts a person after they've been exonerated. And although there is a sealing statute, um, there's still, as you heard earlier, a number of people whose cases are not sealed. And they really, the, the records should be automatically uh, expunged. Anything relating to the arrest or, or sentence after the person has been exonerated. And those records should only be available to the exoneree and the state when they're dealing with the, the claim in the, in the court. I think these recommendations are really reflective of a consensus that has grown that the Court of Claims Act needs modification. That report was issued in 2009, five years ago. To this date, no changes have been made. I think Attorney General, General Snyderman's proposal moves the ball forward and offers legislation that is in the interest of fairness and justice. I hope the legislature and the governor will join in Attorney General Schneiderman's effort to make this legislation a reality and bring some measure of justice to those who have been wrongly incarcerated. Thank you. Good morning, my name is uh, Karen Wolf. I'm a social worker at the Innocence Project and Jeff Deskovic was actually my first client when I got to the Innocence Project in 2006. So we go back a long way and he is a much different person than he was when he walked out of prison then and the world is a better place for it. Thank you. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank Anne for arranging this and um, for all of you for coming and Thank Attorney General Schneiderman and Assemblyperson Lenthal for the um, legislative changes they are proposing. <clears throat> um, I would also like to say that, uh, as Attorney General Schneiderman mentioned, there are many more changes which need to be made. And as you just explained, there are um, huge gaps in what we don't do for people when they're exonerated and they come out of prison. 
Um, you heard the things listed a couple of times already, but uh, there is no fixed amount so that the Court of Claims is free to deny or provide very minimal compensation. Um, there is no, there are no reentry services provided. There are <clears throat> no, there's no automatic expungement. There's no immediate cash assistance. There is no basic level of identification provided. So there are people who come out of prison who have nothing to show the world who they are. And there are two gentlemen exonerated in Brooklyn um, a week and a half or two weeks ago who are not Innocence Project clients, but um, I've been talking to them as a social worker to help them a little bit. They uh, were processed out after being uh, exonerated, having their convictions vacated and their indictments dismissed. They were processed directly out of the courtroom in Brooklyn. They did not go back to the prison, uh, which nobody would want them to have to go back to the prison to be processed out. But when that happens, at least they may be leaving with what they had at the prison. These two gentlemen left from the courtroom with nothing. They do not have birth certificates. They do not have driver's licenses. In fact, they never had driver's licenses because they were arrested when they were 15 and 17 years old. Um, they do not have social security cards. They do not have relatives around who have their social security cards. They do not know their social security numbers. They basically are, uh, it's as if they dropped out of the sky and they were, um, you know, they're similar to um, maybe refugees who came from another country who have to sort of start from scratch here in the United States, even though they are American citizens and were born here, or uh, people who just dropped out of the sky. Um, and it's really hard to imagine unless you sit down with an exoneree or somebody who maybe wasn't exonerated who's been in for 20 years. These gentlemen were in for 20 years. Um, who is coming out after a long period of time may encounter those same issues. Um, it's hard to imagine just being in the world without anything to say who you are or why you've been missing for the last 20 years. Um, so I commend the Attorney General and the Assemblyman for uh, helping us expand the universe of people who are um, able to be compensated under the Court of Claims Act, but I caution everybody and I encourage everybody to be aware that there are many, many more changes which need to be made uh, so that we can um, attempt to have people coming out of prison who were not supposed to be there in the first place get on with their lives. And, um, you know, the, these two gentlemen are, uh, they're paralyzed right now because they can't go anywhere and do anything. Um, and actually, it's interesting, um, they were under the impression that it is illegal to walk around without identification. And I had to think about it myself, and I, I didn't, wasn't aware that there was a law in New York City or in the state uh, or um, in the country that you needed to have identification wherever you went. But they're actually, uh, I think, uh, having been inculcated from the, um, the sort of stop and frisk era that hopefully we are moving out of, that you have to have ID, because once people stop you, which they're going to stop you, the cops are going to stop you on the street, even when you didn't do anything, that you have to have ID on you. So um, what we tell the clients and what their lawyers told them is print out copies of your newspaper articles, of which there are many, and walk around with the newspaper articles, because that's the only thing that has your picture on it and that says who you are. Um, so I, uh, you know, would, would just um, like all of us to think about being in the shoes of an exoneree who has to start life over after 20 years in prison for something they didn't do with nothing. And I don't want you to think that everybody else coming out of prison who may have been rightfully convicted is coming out with a lot. They are not. Uh, but there is a difference in the exonerees versus people who have been rightfully convicted. Is one of the main differences is that an exoneree normally doesn't have a release date. Um, the litigation is happening, the testing is being done, the testing comes back, and at least for our clients who are DNA uh, exonerees, um, the testing comes back and excludes the person as the perpetrator of the crime, 
and then the court and the attorneys work as fast as they can, hopefully together in collaboration, to get the, the um, wrongfully incarcerated person out of prison. Um, but they don't have uh, a release date that's fixed, like somebody who is serving a fixed sentence. And so none of the reentry services, the discharge planning services that go on in prison, take effect for somebody who's an exoneree. Um, normally, my clients are, you know, some weeks, maybe sometimes some months. Um, they have a, a, they have some weeks' notice and sometimes some months' notice before getting out, um, and that's when I'm uh, charged with trying to help plan for what's going to happen to them. But nobody in the prison is making a packet for them. Uh, nobody is getting their ID ready, nobody's applying for their social security card, nobody's applying for their birth certificate, all of those things that usually happen for somebody who has a date of release and is being paid attention to by uh, the division of the De Department of Corrections that uh, plans for somebody's discharge. So there are many more things that need to be done um, and hopefully we can all work together and hopefully this new amendment that um, the Attorney General has proposed is just one of many that he will be looking at and encouraging and introducing into our legislature. Um, thank you very much. Good morning. Can I have some more energy and life in here? We are. I, good morning, everybody. I'm free. God bless. You know, I'm so happy. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm going to share some elements from my personal story. I'm going to touch on what I consider to be some important policy points, and then I'll cover a few miscellaneous uh, topics. Um, <clears throat> as has been said, I served 16 years in prison. I was arrested uh, at the age of 16. I turned 17. By the time I lost a trial, I was wrongfully convicted of murder and rape here in New York, uh, which my wrongful conviction was caused by a coerced false confession, prosecutorial misconduct, fraud by the medical examiner, and an inept public defender. The conviction happened despite a pretrial DNA exclusion. Um, after seven failed appeals and being turned down for parole, I was exonerated through further DNA testing, which not only reaffirmed my innocence, but it also identified the actual perpetrator whose DNA was only in the database because left free while I was doing time for his crime. He struck again, um, killing a school teacher and mother of two just uh, three and a half years later. Um, I was uh, released uh, with nothing. As a result of that, I was never able, it took me about two years to achieve any kind of stability in terms of housing. I bounced from one place to another place to another, uh, at one point very nearly ending up into a homeless shelter before Mercy College, which had already given me a scholarship to finish the bachelor's degree. Uh, they intervened and allowed me to uh, live for a while in their dorms. Whenever I had to go to the city in order to meet with mental health professionals or my attorneys, I could barely afford the train ticket and the subway. Uh, as a result of having being released with nothing and never being able to achieve gainful employment because I didn't have the same job history uh, as other applicants that um, for jobs had, so that was why I was always passed over and hence I was always in a destitute position. Uh, it goes without saying that barely being able to afford the transportation, naturally eating out while I was in the city was out of the question. So um, I'm not ashamed to tell you that in the state that I was, uh, I had to put cereal in a bowl and put it in my backpack and travel with that. I was not above putting cans of tuna fish and spoon and, and a can opener because I couldn't afford to buy anything out. My family had become strangers to me. Uh, there were only a handful of them that intermittently visited me here and there uh, with often gaps of two, three, four years in between and most of them did not visit me at all and so, and so it was always an awkward experience whenever I would encounter them. I knew who they were intellectually from memories from when I was younger but 
having spent significant time away from them, they were different, they were changed and I was changed. I lost connection with all of my former friends. Although I was released at age uh, 33, that was not really my age uh, emotionally and inner. That was really my physical age. So to me, I still wanted to throw a ball around. I still wanted to go to an amusement park. I still wanted to jump off the diving board. All these type of social activities that other people my age were not into. They were past that stage of life in general. And so putting together a new social circle uh, proved to be uh, really impossible. And so loneliness was an extreme uh, obstacle uh, for me. <coughs> In terms of being able to find a spouse, uh, the stigma of having spent 16 years in prison was an obstacle. Was it a, a safe to be alone someplace with me? For even though I should be the same as any of you who've never been arrested and spent time in prison, the fact of the matter is I did spend time in prison. And so that, that stigma, being able to shake that, proved to be uh, difficult in the eyes of some people. In terms of policy, uh, I do applaud the changes that are proposed today. Uh, I wanna make it clear uh, that from my position, uh, we still need to do more for exonerees. From the point of release and to the time of compensation, there's an average length of time between three to seven years. Um, what happens to the exoneree between when they're released and they, and they get compensation, assuming for a moment that they do, but that issue's already been covered. Uh, I believe that it's critical that exonerees be given temporary housing immediate free mental health services. It's typical that people who have spent time in prison wrongfully, that they have uh, PTSD, panic attacks, anxiety attacks, being afraid uh, of simply seeing a police officer, the feeling of having been suspended in time, uh, the feeling of moving at a much slower speed than the rest of the world. Uh, a social worker is a critical aspect in terms of trying to rebuild ties with friends and family where that's even an option because often uh, for a myriad of reasons uh, it's not. Uh, being able to identify what goals that a